Hey there YouTube, Wrestling Optimus here, back with another action figure review. It's Wednesday night, and you know what that means, time for AEW Dynamite on TNT. More specifically, it's Fight for the Fallen, the last of four consecutive special episodes to celebrate the return of live crowds. Yet again, the card is absolutely stacked, and there's bound to be a few surprises, so I'm excited. But first, if you're new here, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more pro wrestling and action figure content. Now, we're headed into my custom arena, so for a recap and review, let's take it over to the action figures. Dynamite opens with a 10-man tag team elimination match between the Elite and Dark Order. Both teams get incredibly elaborate entrances, including a vignette where the Dark Order unleash their inner cowboys and the Elite coming out dressed as the Toon Squad from Space Jam in another perfect example of corporate synergy. The first person eliminated is Alex Reynolds thanks to Carl Anderson grabbing a handful of tights but he immediately gets eliminated by Evil Uno and Stu Grayson with a fatality. Grayson and Doc Gallows brawl into the crowd, and both get eliminated by Countout, while Uno is eliminated by a Kenny Omega one-winged angel. In a very interesting spot, the Bucks utilize a basketball net at ringside to do a combination slam dunk indie taker on John Silver, except the ball bounces off the rim, leading to chance of, You still missed! You still missed! Regardless, they eliminate Silver with a BTE trigger, leaving Hangman Page outnumbered 3 to 1. After absorbing a super kick party, Page manages to hit a double buckshot lariat and simultaneously eliminate both young bucks. Predictably, it all comes down to Omega and Hangman. Kenny tries to use a title belt but gets stopped by the ref. Page hits a dead eye but Omega kicks out. Not to be outdone, Hangman kicks out when Kenny does eventually use his AEW Championship. But in the end, two V-Triggers and a one-winged angel take out the Cowboy and ruin his shot at the world title. Pac implies that someone messed with the Lucha Brothers ride from the airport when Chavo Guerrero walks in with Andrade El Idolo. They say a limo is on its way to pick up Penta and Phoenix, but we never see them on the show. Instead, Andrade says something that I can't understand, but it does have an ominous tone. Taz introduces new FTW champion Absolute Ricky Starks as the New Orleans native is played to the ring by a Dixieland band. He cuts a promo on Brian Cage, so the machine storms down and hilariously lays out various members of the band. He grabs a trombone and chases off Starks, prompting JR to say, There's no trombones in wrestling. Um, Xavier Woods might have something to say about that. In a taped promo, the ace of New Japan, Hiroshi Tanahashi, busts open the forbidden door and challenges the winner of tonight's IWGP United States title match. For the first time ever in regular tag team competition, FTR with Tully Blanchard take on Proud and Powerful with Conan. The story of this match is that both teams had rough upbringings, but under completely different circumstances. Now, they're fighting over who had it worse. An otherwise good match is cut short when Cash Wheeler suffers an apparent injury. Still, Dax Harwood manages to pick up the win for FTR. Tony Schiavone interviews Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, after she tapped out Nyla Rose last week with a broken freaking arm. She says everyone is gunning for her title, and hints that she might have to bring in someone else to help Reba protect her. After it's announced that the first episode of Rampage will air from the United Center in Chicago, Darby Allin and Sting confirm that they'll be there, and say AEW is where you come to prove that you're the greatest, even if you already think that you're the best in the world. The crowd goes nuts for this obvious reference to CM Punk. Oh my gosh, it's happening! 
Next up, the IWGP United States title is once again on the line as new champion Lance Archer defends against Bullet Club Zone Hikaleu, accompanied by his legendary father King Haku. As you'd expect, this is a classic New Japan style hoss fight, with the big men exchanging huge strikes and power moves. But even after Haku interferes using the Tongan Death Grip, Archer is able to get the giant up and nail a blackout to retain. Cody Rhodes is sitting with Tony Khan in gorilla position when he's ambushed by Malachi Black. They fight onto the stage where Malachi stands tall, saying welcome to the House of Black. When a group of wrestlers come to Cody's aid, Malachi lays out Fuego Del Sol with a spinning back heel kick. TNT champion Miro cuts a promo saying no one wants to face him, so he's calling out Lee Johnson. Strangely, he claims only two things motivate him, a vengeful god and his double-jointed wife. The Redeemer finishes by saying Big Shorty's glorious reckoning is upon him. Private Party and Angelico of the Hardy family office take on Jurassic Express and Christian Cage. Early on, Marco Stunt chases Matt Hardy to the back. Although Jungle Boy does most of the work, Luchasaurus does hit a triple suplex on the entire opposing team. Christian follows up a choke slam with a frog splash on Mark Quinn to secure the victory. However, the blade appears from the crowd and lays out Christian with his brass knuckles to help the HFO stand tall in defeat. In women's action, the recently signed Thunder Rosa takes on Julia Hart of the Varsity Blondes. The 19-year-old rookie puts up a decent fight, but eventually Rosa wins with a Fire Thunder driver. John Moxley is pissed that seemingly every top New Japan wrestler avoided him during the pandemic, but the second he lost his US title, suddenly Tanahashi wants a shot. So now the ace is dead to him, while Mox essentially challenges the rest of New Japan in order to see who answers the call. MJF joins commentary for our main event as the Deathmatch King Nick Gage takes on Chris Jericho's Painmaker persona in his second labor. Remember, no one from the inner circle can help Jericho or the deal's off. Early on, Jericho counters some light tubes with Floyd the Bat, but Nick Gage gets out the pizza cutter and slices open Jericho's forehead. Then, he sets a pane of glass between two chairs, but ends up going through it himself. When Gage tries to use some light tubes again, Jericho reverses into a Judas effect for the win. Afterwards, MJF comes down and, after playing a clip from one of their earlier verbal exchanges, he reveals that for Jericho's next labor, he'll have to hit a top rope move against his old WCW foe, Juventud Guerrera. I heard some people were down on this show, but I thought it was another home run. The live crowds remain electric. The in-ring action was great, although it did feel short at times and AEW continues to pay off long-term storylines while simultaneously building up new ones to take their place. Most impressively, despite an ever-expanding roster, AEW somehow fits most of their people into two hours of TV per week. Can you imagine what they'll be able to do once Rampage debuts? The good times are just getting started. Alright, that'll do it for AEW Fight for the Fallen. Thanks so much for watching, let me know what you thought in the comments down below. I might do an unboxing this weekend, otherwise I'll be back next Thursday with another action figure review. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to do all that normal YouTube stuff. Smash the like button, share with any wrestling or action figure fans you may know, subscribe to the channel, and spread the word. You can also talk to me over on Twitter, at WrestlingOptimus, or see all my best figure photography over on Instagram at WrestlingOptimus. If you haven't seen my review of Fighter Fest Night 2, you can check that out right here. But until next time, I've been Wrestling Optimus, and I'll catch you later.